On September 10th of 1945, a farmer in Colorado, United States, cut off the head of a chicken named Mike, but accidentally only removed most of its head while leaving its brain stem intact. Due to a blood clot, the chicken didn't bleed to death, but was able to live for 18 more months while performing many chicken-like actions, such as walking around clumsily, balancing on a perch, crowing, and pecking for food. It was named Mike the Headless Chicken. Looking at the anatomy of a chicken brain, you'd realize that much of Mike's cerebrum was likely removed, leaving behind its cerebellum, which is a smaller part of the brain responsible for movement, balance, and coordination, but is not complex enough to give rise to consciousness on its own. Its owner looked at it and decided to immediately do a career swap, going on tour and charging people money to look at his headless chicken. At the peak of his popularity, the chicken was able to generate the modern-day equivalent of $60,000 per month. It was the most explosive event since the past month. And so the question is, what makes something awake? The view that you can tell if a creature is conscious, just based on its outward behaviors, seems to be disproven by something like Mike the Headless Chicken, which you could say was a real-life example of a philosophical zombie, a being that exhibits signs of being conscious, but is not actually conscious. Especially nowadays as well, as artificial intelligence is able to recreate more and more human characteristics, such as understanding language, visual perception, and gaslighting. The question of consciousness is as old as humanity itself, and sits right at that intersection between science and philosophy. Let's begin with the philosophical debates between dualism and materialism. Dualism, famously supported by philosophers like René Descartes, is the stance that the mind and the body are fundamentally two separate substances, with the body belonging to the physical world and governed by the laws of physics and nature, but the mind not. One can exist without the other, you can have a mind without a body. Descartes is also often credited for coming up with the mind-body problem, which is the natural follow-up question of, well, if the mind and the body are separate substances, then how do they interact with each other? Descartes said it was through this tiny part of the brain called the pineal gland. Huh? I'm not kidding. Man really came along, dropped this hard-ass question for everyone to ponder, and then died before he could give a satisfactory answer. Materialism, which is the opposing view to dualism, says that, no, the mind and the physical brain are not two separate things, but instead the mind fundamentally arises from the physical processes in the brain. This is, of course, the more favored view today as science continues to develop. Dualism implies that even after your body dies, your mind can go into an afterlife. But materialism says, we know that brain damage impairs the functioning of the mind, so if your brain was already damaged before you die, then even if there is an afterlife, are you gonna have your late-stage Parkinson's over there? If you had schizophrenia, are you taking all your imaginary friends over to the other side with you? Of course, our science is not yet developed enough to fully understand how the human brain works, and the fact that we don't know why certain third-person brain processes correlate to certain first-person conscious experiences is known as the explanatory gap. How come this is what happens in the brain when you feel pain? How come this is what happens when you see red? Is my red even the same as your red? The process of science trying to answer these questions is called the search for the neural correlates of consciousness, or NCCs. For example, in order to figure out which part of the brain is responsible for facial recognition, you can give people this image of a face that's really noisy, so some people see the face and some people don't. Then you ask them whether they see the face, but you also record their brain scans at the same time. And then by taking the difference in the brain scans between the yes responses and the no responses, we find out which part of the brain does facial recognition. But even this only answers how certain parts of the human brain are responsible for certain conscious experiences, and not why we're just awake at all, as opposed to not being awake. Do the smaller constituent parts of consciousness, like vision, hearing, touch, memory, thinking, add up and automatically combine into the full conscious experience? Can consciousness be reduced into smaller components 
Or is there some other intrinsic factor that decides, yes, this thing is awake, or no, this thing is not awake, like an on and off switch? And plus, what about things that are not human or even not an animal? Pieces of technology like AI, do they have their own subjective experiences and emotions? And how would we know? Can we create consciousness? So I think the most interesting theory regarding all that, which is also currently considered the most promising theory regarding consciousness as a whole, is the Integrated Information Theory, or IIT. The IIT is all about causality, which means the process of one thing physically influencing another thing through cause and effect. One neuron connected to another neuron, one gear connected to another gear, one redstone connected to another redstone. These are all examples of causality. The theory states that a system of physical elements is conscious if it is able to integrate information through causality. So for example, if there's a red apple on a wooden table, when a camera takes a picture of it, it stores information of all the individual pixels, which do not influence each other through causality. In contrast, when a human sees that scene, we are able to take all the information we gather of the color red, the texture, the shape, the relative position of everything with the brown underneath the red, and integrate all that information to perceive that, oh, it's a red apple on a wooden table through the causality between neurons in our brains. Hence, a human is conscious while a camera is not. This way, the IIT is very general because it implies consciousness does not necessarily require a biological brain, but could also theoretically come from other types of physical systems. To go into more detail, this theory states that there are five necessary conditions in order for a physical system to be conscious. Condition number one, a conscious system has causality on itself. This first assumes that the existence of some thing means that the thing has causality on its environment. So like the existence of a rock means that it has to take up space in its environment, move towards thermal equilibrium with its environment, have a non-zero gravitational pull, etc. Because part of being conscious is being self-aware, meaning consciousness exists from its own perspective, that means that a conscious system must have causality on itself. For example, with the way that neurons are connected in the brain, they are able to fire signals which eventually come back and influence themselves. Condition number two, subparts of a conscious system have causality on each other. So if a brain was arbitrarily divided into three parts, A, B, and C, for example, then A, B, and C each have causality on themselves, A and B have causality on each other, B and C have causality on each other, and A and C have causality on each other. Condition number three, a conscious system has unique states to represent different experiences. For example, the brain has different states to distinguish between watching a movie and reading a book. Condition number four, a conscious system is irreducible into smaller parts because they are all interdependent on each other. If you cut a functioning brain in half, there will necessarily be a loss of information, even though you still have both halves of the brain, because you would have destroyed a lot of connections between both halves. Condition number five, consciousness operates on the maximal conscious structure. A subpart to a system can satisfy the other four postulates but not have its own consciousness because it is absorbed into the biggest conscious structure that is not a subpart of something even bigger. Or else there would be multiple instances of consciousness occurring in the same brain. But maybe what's most important about this theory is that it suggests this mathematical construct known as phi to represent the level of consciousness within a system. Because after all, different systems can have different levels of complexity and still satisfy these five conditions all the same. Fundamentally, this means that consciousness is not a yes or a no, but rather exists on a spectrum. So maybe all the individual parts of human perception, like vision, hearing, cognition, memory, emotions, etc., all do just add up to make us conscious, and there is no secret ingredient. So maybe AI is conscious to some extent. Maybe it sits somewhere in the spectrum between a rock and a human. So how far along is it? 
I gathered some data from this Our World in Data page on the number of parameters in notable AI systems throughout history. The Mark I Perceptron from 1957 was used to distinguish between two types of images such as a circle versus a square, and had around a thousand parameters. Alvin, a self-driving car from 1989, had around 4,000 parameters. The Neocognitron from 1979, which was actually 10 years earlier, was the first ever convolutional neural network used to identify different handwritten Japanese characters and had 1.1 million parameters. AlexNet, a convolutional neural network used to identify images from 2012, has around 60 million parameters. AlphaGo Zero, which was one of DeepMind's AIs that played the board game Go, and AlphaFold, which is DeepMind's AI for predicting protein structures, have 46 and 45 million parameters respectively. The first GPT, a large language model, has 117 million parameters. GPT-2, the second version of the large language model, and Stable Diffusion, which generates images, both have around 1.5 billion parameters. DALI-2, another image generator, has 3.5 billion parameters. LAMA-2, another large language model, has 70 billion parameters. And finally, GPT-3 has 175 billion parameters. So how does this all compare to a human brain? A human brain obviously doesn't have parameters like a computer program does, but the most comparable metric would probably be the number of neuron connections or synapses. Realistically, each synapse is pretty complex and can probably contain information equivalent to multiple parameters. But for simplicity's sake, let's compare the number of parameters in all these AI models to the number of synapses in the human brain. It is estimated that the human brain has 100 trillion synapses. Now, it's important to keep in mind that more parameters doesn't necessarily mean better. The original DALI had 12 billion parameters, whereas DALI 2 has just 3 billion. But the second version is better because it's more efficient. More synapses in the brain doesn't necessarily mean better either. At the age of 2 or 3, the human brain can have twice the number of synapses as it does in adulthood and excess synapses are eliminated over time in a process known as synaptic pruning. But because the remaining synapses are used more efficiently, you would of course expect an adult to be more intelligent than a toddler. Except for me, I peeked in the womb. But still, how come the brain is so much more complex than the most advanced AI we have today, and yet the two have drastically different power requirements? I mean, one requires the most powerful supercomputers with millions of watts of electricity, and the other one just requires a sandwich. You see, in the human brain, neuron connections are simultaneously responsible for storing memory and running computations. But in most modern computers, those two functionalities are performed by separate components, something called the von Neumann architecture. A lot of time is spent just moving data between the memory part and the computation part, which makes it really inefficient to emulate human intelligence on a computer. In George Orwell's 1984, there's a totalitarian government that monitors what everyone says and does, and the surveillance was so bad that Orwell described it as, nothing was your own except the few cubic centimeters inside your skull. He must not have heard about this 2023 paper where fMRI scans were used to reconstruct what people were hearing and thinking. After getting participants to lay in an fMRI machine for 16 hours, while listening to narrated stories, here are some examples of what the AI model was able to reconstruct that the person was hearing. For example, where the actual stimulus said, I got up from the air mattress and pressed my face against the glass of the bedroom window, expecting to see eyes staring back at me, but instead finding only darkness. The decoded stimulus, what the AI thought the person heard based on the scan, said, I just continued to walk up to the window and open the glass, I stood on my toes and peered out. I didn't see anything and looked up again. I saw nothing. Not completely accurate, but we're getting there. Okay, but that's while hearing the audio of someone else telling a story. It also works when people come up with their own stories and imagine telling it with their internal monologue. For example, where one of the participants wrote down afterwards that their story was, look for a message from my wife saying that she had changed her mind and that she was coming back. What the AI decoded in the moment was, 
to see her for some reason. I thought maybe she would come to me and say she misses me. Once again, not completely on point, but it's getting somewhere. Orwell's been real quiet since this paper dropped. Oh no! Either way, I just want to use this mind reading technology on a schizophrenia patient. Surely the experience is like watching a movie. The human brain is the most complex object in the universe. What makes us conscious? What makes us awake? We still don't know. Hopefully, one day science develops enough to give us some answers. But until then, the inner machinations of our minds are an enigma. The inner machinations of my mind are an enigma.